young children to women and men as Asuma Mullen Gaud's family is thronging Malindi Hospital mortuary to collect bodies of their loved ones. You have a story well fleshed out for you on page three of Standard Today. And this is some of the faces as well. Isaac Hinzano Ngala, Rafael Temba, Christopher Were, Judith Farasi. We have Elna Mpa, Brenda Chiang, and of course also a young child there, Seth Hinzano Ngala, uh, who is, I believe, maybe the son to Isaac Hinzano Ngala. And we have Stephen Mwiti, his wife and children are seen in this file picture. I can try and zoom in for you to just see it clearly as well. Uh, all the children died while their mother who was rescued was charged in court. This, of course, is a story that has been here with us. And uh, this is finally where the, some families can get closure as far as this massacre is concerned. You can read the story there, why schools are closing a week early. Some public secondary schools will close this week a week early in what head teachers say is a move to ease financial burden owing to delayed capitation money. You have a story on page four of the standard today. Higher rent on the way for civil servants in government units. Beware, this is what the PS is saying, housing. State plans to increase rents of civil servants leaving in 56,892 housing units across the country by up to 100%. This is on page six of the standard today. And looking at the teaser on top, man's two lives in, in the red in US, rich investor in Kenya. In the red in US, rich investor in Kenya, you can see, and you can read all about it on page two of the standard. Who will it be? Kalonzo Karubato? That is a problem question. You have a story on page six of the standard today. And KQ narrows 2023 loss to 2027 billion shillings. You can follow the story on page 24 of the standard this morning. This is how the publication looks today. Make sure you grab a copy for yourself. And remember also you have the Enterprise magazine coming in handy for you from profit to purpose. The rise of social entrepreneurs. All that inside the publication today. The standard job losses as 140 state firms to go. This is what is headlining the front page of the Daily Nation today. Also looking at the flag of government, President Ruto announces plans to shut down loss-making state corporations. And uh, you can read all about it inside on page four and five, facing the acts. Thousands of workers risk losing their jobs in a renewed push by government to merge or wind up parastatals that are performing similar functions or training public coffers by being perennially in the red. Also, audit reveals grim reality of maternity hospitals in counties from insufficient equipment, shortage of trained health workers, to neonets having to share incubates or incubators as mothers share beds. A report by the Auditor General has revealed the distrusting condition of maternity facilities in the countries, in the counties. Uh, the audit conducted in Nairobi, Mombasa, Kisumu, Nakuru, Bungoma, Taita, Taveta, West Pokot, Makueni, Siaya, Isiolo, Garissa County evaluated the state of maternal and newborn health services in public hospitals. We have a story well fleshed out for you on page 10 of the Daily Nation. On the sidebar, rent shocker for civil servants living in government houses. I uh, don't need to be labeled that, you know the story, but you can read all the details as well on page six of the Daily Nation. And from Vroom, Motorsport, Dwele Shakedown gets the iconic WRC Safari Rally going. The first real action of this Safari Rally begins today at Ndulele Conservancy in Naivasha, ahead of the rally's official start at the Castle Rally Super Special Stage tomorrow. You have a story all related for you on page 50 and 51 of the Daily Nation. Looking on the teaser, one president, two first ladies meet Senegal's Basiro Faye. Right, his story is on page three of the Daily Nation, the youngest president right now, uh, elect of Senegal. Half of young Kenyans would rather start business than seek employment. This is a new study that is revealing this. This is on page two of the Daily Nation today. All right, let's see what we have on the front page of the star. Politicians fuel ethnic hirings in parastatals. Report shows bosses continue to flood entities with tribesmen and women in disregard of law. You have a story on page four and five of the star today. Enough is enough. Nakuru, Nakuru doctors demand posting of interns. And you can see how it went down yesterday. Uh, this is a protest from the doctors. And 
You can see also the clinical officers uh, threatening to join the strike as well. Read all about it inside the star this morning. And we hope this will be solved uh, soon enough so that uh, many Kenyans who are suffering right now can get attention, medical attention from the public hospitals. Arrest warrant for Devani after oil tycoon skips court. A Nairobi court yesterday issued a warrant of arrest against oil tycoon Yagnesh Devani after he failed to show up for a ruling in a case where he is charged with 1.5 billion shillings fraud. The warrant followed an application by the state after Devani missed the court session for the second time. You have a story on page two of the staff. DPP to be fired for dropping cases. A new proposed law, the withdrawal of charges against high-profile suspects could soon land the director of public prosecutions in trouble if a new proposal is enacted into law. According to proposed regulations, the DP or the DPP could be kicked out of office for dropping high profile cases without a proper explanation to Kenyans. And we've seen this happening. Maybe this also will be a remediate action that can try and salvage the situation where we have the apparatus of government also trying to shoehorn and uh, control these offices. We have a story on page six of the start today. Relief as state releases 23 billion shillings. School capitation, school principals can now breathe easy. After the government released 23 billion shillings for ladders capitation, unions, uh, teachers unions have threatened to go on strike following delayed release of the funds, which are crucial in day-to-day -day operations of the institutions. We have a story on page nine of the star this morning. This is our looks. And also experts explain why Nairobi experiences serious flooding whenever it rains. And you can see one of the victims there trying to drain out some of the flood, the flooding that happened to her house. Read all about it inside the star this morning. Parastatal's boss is in big trouble. This is what the People Daily is holding this morning. Ruto reads the riot act for non-performing state funds, bosses to improve their fortunes or be faced out. You have a story on page four of the People Daily and the medics Luta Continua, it says here, doctors demonstrating Nakuru streets yesterday against failure by government to listen to their demands. The medics are on strike to push for better terms of service and employment of interns. And this is a story you want to follow inside the People Daily as well. Joho steps up campaign to inherit Raila's base, that is on page 8. Safari Rally lovers took to die Vasha. And you can see there uh, one of the Fast and the Furious car that will be on that particular rally being put in mint condition to be prim and proper for the competition. You can follow the story on page 26 and 27 of the People Daily this morning. Diomai set to become Senegal president. Ruling coalition candidate backed by outgoing head of state concedes defeat. And this is where everybody now is in support of the young president elect. You can follow the story on page 15 of the People Daily this morning. This is our looks today. Let's see what we have on Taifa Leo. Majangili Wana helicopter. Right? That is the story. Commissioner Ukunda wa Rift Valley. Amuru ndege nayo tua eneo hatari idunguliwe na polisi. Maswali yameibuka ya kuhusu uwezekano wa majangili wanao hangaisha wakazi county za Baringo na Samburu kunufaika na huduma za helikopta ambazo kwa miaka miwili sasa zimekuwa zikionekana maeneo wanako wanako feature. And this is a story you can follow on page 2. Of course, our panelists will tell us about this particular latest development of helicopter, which is stripes in the skies there in Baringo. And uh, what does it pretend as far as security is concerned? Familiar as a Pokea Mili Shakahola. And you can read the story on page two. Naibu Waziri Kulipua Biloni Kumi Kwamwaka. Mshara Huoni Kandu na Marupurupu. Bengine Kama Magari Matibabu. Pensheni. That is a story that you can follow on page three of Taifa Leo. TSC Motoni Kuhusu Baguzi. All that also inside Taifa Leo. Let's buckle down to some business states. Texon Steel Tycoons with new 220 billion shillings plans 
project to be implemented by government-owned NMMC. Steel industry has been fighting price-fixing claims. Uh, the Kenya government plans to spend 220 billion shillings in the next five years to set up new iron and steel plants in a move that is likely to rattle private sector players in an industry that is under a tight grip of a dozen tycoons. The investment revealed in the government's 16 trillion shillings for the medium term plan, that is MTP4, released at a ceremony present. President uh, William Ruto was presiding over last week is being fronted as part of government's effort to increase local production of uh, metals at a time the state is growing big on construction of affordable houses. And you can read the story inside the business daily today. Housing ministry moves to triple rent for civil servants. Civil servants who have been paying as low as 30,000 shillings monthly in rent for three bedroom houses located in prime locations will dig deeper into their pockets if the treasury approves if treasury approves proposals to triple the amount housing principal secretary charles hinga told parliament that he has written to treasury seeking approval to review the rent for the five or fifty six thousand eight hundred and ninety two civil servants houses that has remained unchanged for the past 23 years you have a story in page two of the business daily electricity demands to record high on at record high on economic resurgence and basigo gets 395 million shillings to scale up elect electric ba bus manufacturing kenya airways cuts losses by 40 percent on higher ticket sales you have a story on page seven of the business daily this morning let's cross over to uganda where noisy prayers lands pastor in police cells this is all about noise pollution. A Pentecostal pastor who had been on the run since July last year is among the first men of God. Police detained two years after President Museveni sought a diplomatic resolution over rising noise pollution countrywide. You have a story on page four and five of the Daily Monitor this morning. Does loud noise disturb people at night? Museveni questions noisy worshippers. Does loud noise disturb people at night? Is it godly to insist on noisy overnights? This is all about cashers. Why do you wait to make noise when people are sleeping? That is <laughs> typically present theorem 70. Does God need megaphone to hear your prayers, right? Does God need megaphones to hear your praise and prayers? This is uh, what the Daily Monitor is holding this morning. Interesting, all right. So a post give up for many of the church goers as well with the cashers and uh, people complaining around the noisy pollution or the noise pollution. All right, then we have protest in Gulu city over fuel station in wetlands. That is a story that you want to follow. And also Senegal Paul's fire from a known jail bar to Africa's youngest president just a week ago. Let me try and zoom, zoom in so that we can read together. And it says just weeks ago, the man said to be Senegal's next president, that is Basirui, a relatively unknown figure outside his opposition party, Pastef, was sitting in a prison cell. Everything changed for him when the party's firebrand leader, Os Osmani Sonko, who was also detained, was charged with insurrection in July and barred from running in elections to succeed President Macky Sall. You have a story on page 28 of the Daily Monitor this morning. And how to bring more women into corporate boardrooms women still face challenges limiting them from climbing up the corporate ladder this is what the new times in rwanda is holding today and it says uh, a new onwards pledge to bolster ties with rwanda that's another story there but you can read the the headline or the headlining story there on page three of the daily monitor these are the new envoys I Commissioner Julie Crowley of Canada, Ambassador Namini Mohammed, Esam El Din, Ishafi El Zarawi of Egypt, and High Commissioner Janet Mawasi Oben of Kenya. Three, the three envoys presented their letters of credence to President Paul Kagame at Village Oruguiro on Tuesday. And you can read the story on page two of the New Times, right? And you can see the Kenyan 
diplomat there quite essentially also having that particular band on her head with the Cajun colors. EA Business Council pushes for raising cap on duty-free goods and MP sets six-month deadline for construction of households affected by Rusumo project. You can follow the story inside the New Times of Waking Up in Rwanda. And back like he never left, this is what the East Africa is holding this week. Museveni's son, General Muhosi, is now Army Chief after his promotion coming at a time. The veteran leader is going for seventh time. Question. Is standby generator now on or off? You have a story on page 10. And maybe Dr. Hassan Kaninja can tell us or Professor Peter Kagwanja this probing question, right? I think it is very abstract, right? What does it really mean? Is standby generator now on or off? It's a riddle. Mm. Dr. Hassan Kaninja, good morning. Good to see you. Uh, good morning, Dibal. And uh, Kenyans who are watching. Well, this standby generator uh, is always on standby, but it's normally in an off uh, mode. And it's activated when there's need. Because if it's on, it means, well, you've lost power. And I think at the moment it is off, but it's just ready for activation at a moment's notice. <laughs> All right, uh, Peter Kagwanja. <laughs> mm. uh, thank you, Dibal, for, for the invite. Uh, I have a slight cold, so oh. my, my tone. We pray it breaks soon. No, it's a, I, I entered the Beijing in spring, uh, Kenya style. You know, the, the weather here, we take it for granted. It is, uh, it's the best. You, you don't have to dress heavily or light. It's your choice. But there, you've got to very, very clear and monitor the weather. I know what it is, so uh, that's that. Well, I, I think you should, the story of Uganda is a very unique one because it's not just about, uh, you know, U Uganda itself, it's about Uganda it's in, and its neighbors. It's about Uganda and the influence it has had. But inside Uganda, I think the national resistance movement of Museveni uh, has an iron grip on the politics. You can have an opposition, it might be even be popular, but the NRM machine is, is nothing to compare with anything that can come out uh, inside Uganda. And uh, so when you get uh, General Muhonzi there, it, it's a signal that uh, NRM is still on. Uh, yes. it's, uh, because it, uh, it's a movement with the two wings. One wing is the uh, national resistance movement, which is the political wing, and national resistance army which is the military yes, wing. Sir. And very few countries have that kind of a, you know, a, 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 a situation. Um, the, the National Resistance Army managed to defeat all its uh, lag tag rivals. Mm. And therefore, it has total monopoly over instruments of violence and has top, total monopoly over the political space. And uh, therefore, it is a generator, the standby generator on. I don't think Uganda operates on the on a standby generator, because it is, Museveni uh, is not the kind of a leader you'd say is, uh, is threatened by anything within mm. his own country. Uh, just because of how he came to power. I remember, I, I, I know you, you, you do remember when uh, he was asked when he's leaving. <laughs> You're familiar with that joke mm -hmm. that was asked to, to Mugabe uh, by the BBC. Uh, Your Excellency, when are you, when are you leaving the, the Zimbabweans? And then uh, he answered back, where are they going? <laughs> you, you know? The, the same question would ask, be asked by Museveni. The Ugandans are not going anywhere, and Museveni is not going anywhere. They're just going to have a ritual called election, and that's it. Why? Because uh, Museveni, in his, own, like, in his own imagination, and in reality, uh, is basically what you call uh, a, a guerrilla revolutionary. Mm -hmm who literally uh, shot his way into power. So he leaves when he wants, and when he thinks the condition for his country is, is uh, you know, conducive. Uh, so, uh, Muhonzi, if Museveni's idea is that Muhonzi is his successor, it's a foregone conclusion. That there is nothing that can be done about it. Reason being, Museveni has a political machine stronger than any that you have ever seen on the African continent. By the way, this is something that uh, us as Kenyans in mm -hmm. our normal hubris 
uh, forget that the government in, in Rwanda is born of Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, a series of governments in Democratic Republic of Congo owes their, uh, their existence to Uganda. South Sudan is the way it is because, because Uganda is. Mm -hmm. And even its own current survival and uh, you know, going on has everything to do with Uganda. Mm -hmm. The Ugandan army, the military is there. You can go on and say Tanzania and Uganda has a bond since the, the war against Amin. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if there is any strong bond, it's not between Kenya and Uganda. It's actually between uh, Tanzania and Uganda. Mm -hmm. It's both ideological, uh, it's military, and so on. And finally, Somalia is being stabilized by the Ugandan troops. The Ugandan tro Uganda has the largest contribution of troops, fewer troops, mm -hmm. uh, who, which are guarding the main cities, particularly Mogadishu. So what are we talking about? A country that is able to pacify itself mm -hmm. and also pacify its neighbors, therefore has huge capacity to decide its own future. And Muhonzi is not there by accident. Mm -hmm. All right, it's not there by accident. We shall be looking at that much, much later in the course of the program. But uh, for now, we know the rains are here. And the weatherman says the wet season will last months. How are urban authorities coping with the resultant flooding and suffering of residents? How are farmers dealing with the disturbing news of proliferation of substandard fertilizer? We have news about that, of course. And uh, what we are following with the, the latest uh, with the story there in uh, Senegal. Now, families bereaved by the catastrophic Shakahola massacre have started receiving bodies of their loved ones. Amidst their sorrow, at least seven families from Kilifi and Western region have received bodies of their kin after processing. Meanwhile, there is skepticism over the exercise with some organizations like the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, questioning the government's commitment to resolve the aftermath of the massacre. They say the process is being carried out at a snail's pace. Nearly one year lapsed since the Shakahola horror story was exposed. And today marks a grim milestone as the first set of victims' remains have been handed over to their kin. The bodies are in a great state of decomposition. They're mostly skeletons. Uh, very, very sad scenarios for families to watch. We've been told that uh, one of the children uh, did not match the DNA. So now we've been given only four. <laughs> The KNCHR had last week voiced concerns over the government's handling of the repatriation process for the Good News International Church members' remains. Further repatriation are anticipated, with two more individuals from Kilifi and one from the Western region awaiting the return of their loved ones. It is one year later, we have still only 33 bodies identified. There are 390 plus bodies yet to be identified positively. Going at this rate, we are going to be here for 10 years trying to identify the 390 plus bodies. The process is rather slow. So if that's going to be the speed of releasing the bodies, I think we're going to be here for over a month to release 33 bodies. Irungu Houston, the Director General of Amnesty International, corroborates the challenges faced by many in claiming the bodies. Like the Kenya National Commission for Human Rights, we are deeply concerned by the delay in releasing uh, the 400 bodies that still remain um, in the malignment must find the resources to be able to support families, to be able to uh, receive their bodies and to transport them. Many of these families come from four to five hundred kilometers away. Stephen Mwiti, who suspects he lost six children in the massacre, is a man in agony. He is yet to identify or locate remains of his family members. The DNA is yet to be performed on some of the bodies. <laughs> To date, out of 429 bodies exhumed from the mass graves at Shakahola, only 34 have been positively identified. 
nimetoka Meru na kupeleka mwili mmoja kutoka hapa mpaka Meru ni kama laki moja na nusu. Na mimi ni mtu si ni mwanzo sina kazi. Kazi yangu ni ya uchuzi ya kuuza kahawa na basically ndio huwa nauzi. Hata nikapewa hiyo mili mili yote yote nikapewa ndio hii. Sina uwezo wa kusika. Kwa hivyo kama serikali hawataweza kutusaidia. Mimi sina uwezo wa kusika hiyo mili pengine ni waachie. Tumekuja tunaulizwa mmekuja na gari na tukawa kwamba hatukukuja na any means ya kuweza kumchukua huyo ndugu kama ni wetu na hiyo ndio changamoto ambayo niko nazo wapo tutapewa huo mwili vile tutausafirisha mpaka western itakuwa ni vigumu kidogo The Malindi Sub County Hospital has become a hub of anticipation of numerous families await the release of their loved ones bodies the departed were followers of the Good News International sect led by the controversial preacher Paul Mackenzie whose doctrine is believed to have led to their demise the legal repercussions are now unfolding as Mackenzie along with 94 others face multiple charges in connection with the deaths of 429 individuals in court across Mombasa and Malindi Ode Francis Katia News Nairobi with schools set to close for the first time holidays next week public secondary schools are still struggling with inadequate funds thanks to a huge shortfall in competition for the first term released by the government while every learner in public secondary school is supposed to receive 11,122 for term one capitation the government released only 3,877 shillings forcing some of them to consider closing schools earlier as the shadow committee now reports Every student in public secondary school is supposed to receive 22,244 shillings per year. The money is supposed to be distributed in the ration of 50% in term 1, 30% in term 2, and 20% in term 3. However, with schools set to close next week, the government has only released 3,000. 877 shillings instead of the required 11,122 shillings per student for term one. The free day secondary school of 22,244 was was instituted in 2017. Currently, the Kenyan shilling has depreciated. What we had expected was something like to increase the figures higher. So we need a thorough total audit for the issue of capitation in our schools within the ministry because we believe a lot of money is remaining in the ministry. Are you aware that principals are being forced to write receipts of monies that they have not expended and forward to the ministry? With the government reportedly owing nearly 58 billion shillings to public secondary schools, principals have been under pressure to close schools earlier than expected. This is a very, very dangerous trend. It is important to note that not most of the uh, received funds went to clear the debts owed to sundry creditors. It is upon the Ministry of Education to actually give the exact numbers of students who are in all schools. The fact is that this ministry does not include all the students because there are many students outside there. Who are not on names. Some schools have already been taken to court by suppliers for failing to pay money for services offered and goods supplied. Political leaders and other education stakeholders have folded the Ministry of Education for being inconsistent over capitation. Recently, Education Principal Secretary Belio Kipsang noted the student population had risen by one million, posing a significant challenge to government funding. Appearing before the National Assembly's Public Accounts Committee, Kipsang said the government would release 16 billion shillings to finance school operations. The PS told the committee that the government had allocated 65 billion shillings for free secondary education, with 25% of this amount already released. Shadrach Committee, KT News. No, President William Ruto has put on notice state corporations that continue making losses. The president, who was addressing parastatals heads and CEOs at State House Nairobi, said some of his parastatals will be closed down and further directed a 30% budget cut for them. Jeff Kirui has more. As President William Ruto gears for his second budget in office, his eyes are set on state corporations running on taxpayers' money and making losses. We will shut them down. 
we will get the employees to go and work somewhere else and we just stop making the losses. At least we will stop making the losses. And I want some of those institutions to volunteer. Because if you don't volunteer, you know, yeah, some of them should start tell us, this institution here to tafadali fungeni, tizi to tafutie kase malingine, tuende tufanye, alafu ndio wa Kenya waweze kupote, wawache kupoteza pesa zao. We need state corporations that are drained to the exchequer. They bring nothing. They just take away what we need for our roads, what we need for our water, what we need for electricity connection. I know some of you would be uncomfortable with that conversation. But that conversation somehow must take place. Among the drastic measures President Ruto's administration is considering taking include budget cuts for parastatals during the 2024-2025 financial year. The move will see some of the institutions lose up to 30% of their allocations. So we must cut down on our expenditure. We must rationalize. We must make it much more efficient. We must deal firmly and decisively with pilferage and wastage and theft and the so evident corruption. The directive by President Ruto coming just months after Kenya's finance ministry offered 11 companies up for sale in what the government said is geared towards efforts for fiscal consolidation and sparring economic development. Among the state corporations that find themselves on the chopping board include KICC, New Kenya Cooperative Creameries KCC, Kenya Literature Bureau, National Oil Corporation, Kenya Seed Company Limited, Kenya Pipeline Company, among others. President Ruto reiterated his commitment of having an economic turnaround by implementing the agenda that informed his election to office. And I did not become president so that I fill up the position or earn the salary. No, that's not why I'm president. We must change our country. We must change our country. For some time now, the issue of privatization and sale of some parastatals has been a headache with the government appearing to shift positions on the issue after Kenyans questioned the plan. Jeff, Kirui KTN. And finally, as the doctor's strike heads to a third week, the medics appear and moved with those in Nakuru County holding peaceful protest along the city streets. Health services in level four and level five hospitals have been seriously affected by the strike, leaving the patients in anguish. Osagishu and Meru also witnessed street protests by the doctors calling on the government to head, or to heed, I should say, to their demands. Ken Gichui has more. Doctors and medical graduates yet to get employed congregated outside Nakuru Level 5 Hospital chanting unity songs. For five hours, the doctors held peaceful protests along the streets of Nakuru City before camping outside Governor Susan Kehika's office to register their plea. Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union KMPDU Secretary General for the South Rift Region, Dr. Stephen Omondi, pointing accusing fingers at the current and previous administrations for non-implementation of their 2017-2021 collective bargaining agreement. There are issues that have been agreed upon and it was implementation that was to be done some seven years ago. It's the posting of the interns as per the CBA of 2017-2021. Several meetings have been done. It is just promises and promises. And we have a cabinet secretary that takes health to be a political field. Among their demands is the engagement of additional medical interns and a review of their medical insurance cover as well as their basic salaries. The strike has had serious impact on service delivery in public hospitals. It is incorrect to say that the, the facilities are not working. They are working. Are they strained? Yes, they are strained. Are we coping? We are trying the best that we can. Kwa ndaktari, ilasma uwe ulifanya vizu, ulifanya vizuri. 
Kwa hivyo kama kuna watu wanatakiwa wachungwe ni nyinyi. Na sio kama Meru. Najua tuko na shinda ya ya kansa. Similar scenes were witnessed in Meru and Uasin-Gishu counties. Kenya MPDU Upper Eastern Chairperson Dr. Dennis Mugambi led his colleagues to the County Assembly of Meru. Tunataka kuambia serikali ilianza kuguza madaktari kichwa this is by now eating into the into our pay slips through removing the housing levy and they reduce our salaries by 2.5% of, of something called shift. Doctors from across the country have vowed to meet in Nairobi on Thursday for a major protest. And as this escalates, the ordinary Kenyan who cannot afford services at private facility now apparently on their own. Ken Gashuhi, KTN News. Faramalim, you actually commented on this uh, yesterday that nobody should tamper with the training or enumeration of intern doctors in our country. We have since independence produced the best doctors in all English medium countries at that level. When our medical officers go to practice in all Commonwealth countries and the US, they are celebrated. Our interns run effectively, efficiently, big hospitals. They perform flawlessly certain surgical procedures that are only performed by specialists in the developed world. Let's take health services back to the national uh, government. Yeah. Good morning. Thank Good you. Good morning to you. How are you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, let's... Uh, first of all, let's, let's start from the beginning. The people who go to... Uh, the students, the young students who go to study medicine are the crema de la crema. It's the top. These are the people who had aesthetics in their KCSCs. And, and medicine is a, is a very serious business. We've heard, and I want to celebrate the late uh, Professor Mungai, mm. the early people who really did so much, uh, Dr. Majale, I mean, all, all those very, very, very early people, early, Ken early Kenyans, soon after independence, who did, who established this university, or what they call the medical school. And, 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 and our doctors are trained better than any other doctors anywhere in the world. I can say this without any fear of contradiction. When you see an intern in Kenya, they perform surgeries that are only performed by either final year registrars or specialists in other parts of the world. If you have a problem like malaria anywhere else outside Kenya, mm -hmm. and, and, and in the States or in, in Canada or in, you better take the next flight back, otherwise you'll die there. <laughs> or you have meningitis, any of these things. And, and I come from a medical family. I have um, a son who's a specialist, I have a daughter who's a doctor, I have another son, I have, I have a wife who's a pediatrician. So basically, we, we, we are a medical family. I think that is one area we should support to the health. Even if we don't think we're going to be able to absorb them in due course, the, the, the many of them are going to do what you call the MLE, it's the American uh, exams, and they do the PLAPS, which is the UK. And, uh, and somebody tells me that some of those exams, Kenyans are even exempted. They will get employment in the rest of the world. But for us, one, let's make sure that medicine does not become an elite club where only the, the children of the rich can study. Because right now, yesterday I was, I was for, for the best part of the day, mm -hmm. following up on, on the best student from the Coast Province, who is the daughter of a single mother, and who was uh, given 107,000 shillings only, out of about 600,000, 700,000, which she has to pay. Where will she get the rest of the money from? But a child from a, a family, you know, Kagwanya's family, Farah's family, anybody else who even had a bare minimum, which is a B standing, can get to the university because the family can afford that. So we, we, we need to do a lot when it comes to medicine. Uh, one, take good care of these doctors when they finish. The interns should be properly paid and, 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 and given an opportunity for them to start their process as interns straight from the university. Once they finish the exams, let them go straight away and start practicing. Start, start being trained as interns. And when, when they finish, we try and absorb them as much as we can. County governments have had a, what they call a faulty and a very, 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 very bad what they call priorities. Mm -hmm. Because 70% of the workers in the county governments are basically cost, cost workers. 
There are people who even live in Europe and America and Canada and the rest of them who are earning salaries from the county governments. The same county governments right now, if you go to the provincial hospitals there, is a disaster. And, and they've taken, they have, they have never taken any, there is no project, medical health project in the county governments. Maybe you could find one or two or three county governments that are an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. But there's a problem, a serious problem. At least when we had this being manned by the central government, we, we had some semblance of, mm. uh, of, of you know, uh, we, had, we, had, we had good people. I, I, I don't know where Dr. Kimani is, who used to be the director of medical services. I mean, we had a raft of many, many, Dr. Manzia. We had KP Kenyans who are committed to the delivery of health services to the four corners of the country. And, and, and they worked very well. The late Professor Meme, uh, 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 oh, Professor Muga, I mean, we had, we had people who, who had the heart there. You see, medicine is not a thing you do because you're earning money from it. It's, 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 a, it's a call. It's a call. And, and the, the, you want to treat people. You want to make a difference in somebody's life. Now, right now, we have interns or prospective interns who have gone into depression. We have registrars who are specializing, who have committed suicide because they are unable to cope with the demands. They're supposed to pay a school fees for, 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 for specializing. And the most unfortunate thing. The most unfortunate thing. And then in addition to it, they've got to hop from one lockup to the other lockup being paid 700 shillings mm -hmm. an hour. And, 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 and they have a family. And mm -hmm. they're taking matatus from place to place. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no jobs for them. You, you, you know what I mean? Eh? Mm -hmm. So, so this, is, this, is, this is ridiculous. That's no wonder. The people with mental cases right now, mm -hmm. it's an imagined area. There's so many young people, doctors, who have mental cases. I think when a country has a problem with its health sector, or the providers of health, the doctors, the nurses, they, they all clinicians and all the other, in the other, in the other support with equal areas, and you have problem also with teachers, that country is rotten. With, with those are two areas, we, we, you know, that, that was, those were the fundamental things. One, you know, Ujinga. Mm -hmm. Ugonjwa. <laughs> you know this, but what did you say when we get to God in Venice? No maskini. No maskini. No no so that you don't go hungry. You see, and this, the other two were the, the second and the third most important areas because if you go hungry, you will starve to death. At least we have to have a, be a nation that is able to feed itself, mm -hmm. treat itself, and educate itself. Now, those are the three areas we have the biggest challenges right now. Kenyans are going home and sleeping hungry. Kenyans are not getting the right medical service. Actually, the providers themselves are sick. So when the provider, the man who's supposed to cure you, <laughs> God cures, <laughs> the man who's supposed to treat you is sick. Is uh, mentally... Yeah, yeah, he's sick. And, and then the teachers, the kind of problems they have also with, the, with teaching all over, the, all over the country. So these three areas, I was telling yesterday, I was with a bunch of my friends and colleagues in parliament, I told the, the, the chairman of the budget committee, look, I don't care whether you take money from us in parliament here. Parliament, whether you're going to take money from us or take from every other sector, but doctors have got to be taken with care of unpaid. And they have to be in job. You, know, you see, an, an, an intern now earns about 165,000, it's close to 200,000. But when he comes out again to look for a job, he takes about three years or two years before he can get a job. Yeah. And when he gets it, how much do they pay them? 120,000 shillings gross, take home is 86,000 shillings. And occasionally, that same doctor is also attending doing a, a postgraduate study somewhere and wants to fin finance his own uh, education, which is now gone over the roof. Mm -hmm. Because when you have 600, 800,000 shillings for training a doctor in this country, I think there was a, it's, it's a deliberate decision to make sure this thing an elite, you know, elite field, only for the people who have the money. Thank you. So, so, so basically, all those things comp uh, compounded together. We have a problem, and we need to deal with that. I have no problem with uh, us closing down all the parastatals uh, for information. Mm. If they're draining money, take the money from them and take it to the health sector. Give it to the doctors and mm -hmm. the nurses and, and all other you know, health providers and our health sector itself. Thank you. And, and, and do something also about education. Right. Let, let's hear from uh, Dr. Hassan Kananja. Are you also for the view that uh, it should uh, be going back to the national government? Okay. Because ideally, even if they're in the counties, the exchequer is the national government at the end of the day. So they, they need the money. Who is holding the pass? Well, one who really, uh, who, who calls the tune is, hmm? you is know, the one with the money. Uh, Mishmiwa here has said that uh, you used to have 
uh, leaders within the health sector who are committed to health services. Unfortunately, at the county level, you have a lot of people who are committed to corruption services, and it becomes a challenge. Now, uh, at the idea of us having a new uh, constitutional dispensation of, was informed, of course, by a lot of mishaps that had you know, taken place in our country, and we wanted to change course and direction uh, for us to have a better country. I think the challenge is we were a little bit too rushed. Uh, one of the things that, uh, while there was an excitement to devolve everything, there are certain sectors that you really uh, cannot be able to devolve in a way that is rushed. And that is health, for instance. Mm -hmm. Now, not only has it been almost impossible for counties to actually cater uh, to when it comes to medical services, it has also made it almost impossible for a newly, you know, uh, uh, minted doctors to even get jobs in certain counties. Why? Because of the extreme nature of nepotism and uh, tribalism that is going on in a lot of those places. So you go to look for a position at a county and you're told maybe you need to go back to your home country. And which is home country? You know, just because I'm karaoke, it doesn't mean my home country is Nyeri. You know, at times my home country is, is Transoya. And uh, this has affected the ability of a lot of young health professionals to actually secure employment or internships or even secure opportunity. As second, it is true, of course, the ultimate exchequer is the national government. But things work different in terms of priorities. Mm -hmm. It is one thing when you have resources and you can bring resources to bear as a national government. It is another thing uh, to be able to mobilize the same at a county level, mm -hmm. which literally you know, works at the mercy, of course, of the national government, in part because many of our county government still do not have the capacity to generate their own resources, either because they just don't have enough resources or we just ex also extremely lazy to be able to increase the efficiency in which we can be able to collect certain resources at a county level to make up for some of the shortfalls that we may be getting from the national government. And I'm saying this because it's unlikely the national government is going to significantly increase the amount of resources going to the county. Mm -hmm. uh, but also thirdly, I think it's not worth it to mention that an overwhelming uh, the, the larger bulk of a county uh, you know, budget, you know, rarely goes to anything that can actually grow any sector mm -hmm. particularly. Either is going through salaries or is being stolen, mm -hmm. you know, recurrent expenditure and the rest is being stolen, you know, through tenderpreneurship by county officials themselves. No wonder... The governors, actually. Yes, by the governors and, and their associates. No wonder at the county level people have become increasingly rich nowadays. You know, you find someone, you know, complete dropout and somehow they're having property worth almost a billion shillings, you know. In Millions, years. not millions. Exactly. And, yeah. and uh, you know, they're barely 30 years old. You, know, you wonder what happened. And, and, and so it is, I think it's time we start thinking uh, seriously if we care about this country on how we can be able to return, uh, especially medical services to the national government. You see, a passion without some policy cannot help you make any progress. So we are passionate about, yes, we want more devolution. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want to be able to uh, improve our health sector and pay our doctors better. But with, if it's not much by sound policy and realistic reflection on the way forward, I think it's just going to be futile. It is embarrassing that doctors and teachers, you know, uh, cannot be taken care of. Today, if you are, you are vulnerable, for instance, and you rely on government services, you know, because the majority of Kenyans cannot afford private hospitals, yes. you, you're pretty much dead, you know. Mm. Uh, if you're having something that is preventable, uh, but that requires medical help, you may just be being sent into a deathbed. So, so it is, it, 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 this is not a partisan issue, it's not even a political issue. You know, it's a human rights issue, it's an existential issue for, for us as a country, because a country that is not healthy, as a country that is sick, you cannot start thinking about uh, setting your priorities for development right if you cannot even take care of your own people when it comes to either uh, health or education or food security. Mm -hmm. And these are, a num they, these are key areas that we should actually invest in as a country. And again, uh, sometimes we tend to politicize a lot of issues. We know this issue did not start with this government. This issue has been going on for a while. 
But of course, things are increasingly getting worse. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of qualified interns, for instance, out there, or young graduates who cannot even get uh, get, 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 get an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, perhaps a final take. Uh, there's been, I think, a desire to uh, find opportunities for Kenyans outside. And that is laudable, well, when it comes to certain sectors. When it comes to things such as health, uh, we don't have the luxury of exporting doctors because we don't even have enough. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to technical fields, for instance, that we need for our own engineers, growth, engineers. In, like engineering, we don't have <laughs> the luxury of exporting these people because it is impossible to attain vision 2030 or even 2063 for the continent uh, in Kenya's own perspective if we export our best or we discourage our best from staying here because we cannot take care of them. Many countries and almost all countries that have actually made advancement uh, in socioeconomic aspects, they've ensured that they retain their best brains mm -hmm. and not part with it. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. I think it's, uh, let me just hear from uh, uh, Professor Mashareb just briefly. We take a short break briefly on this particular matter. And uh, of course, just to also give you a hearty welcome in the morning. Good morning, good morning. Good, good morning. Yeah, the, um, briefly. Mm -hmm. um, one, the problem is not money. It's the, the mind. Is a mind. Yes. Policy makers are the ones in the wrong. They appoint the wrong people into the wrong positions, overpay them, and they do nothing. Health and education are not things you debate about. Yeah. You do it mm. because it's the national interest. So what has happened is that we have relegated a social obligation into the pit as we glorify misfit mm -hmm. yeah. in high positions. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what we are doing. When we were convinced by some forces outside, the forces of postmodern colonialism, eh? <laughs> they, yeah. they told us that you should have something called cost sharing in health and in education. Eh? So our investors started going down, yes. our health services started going down, and the health of the country was going down. It's ridiculous to say that you cannot employ doctors. They are not enough. Yeah. And we say we don't have money to employ doctors, and we have money to hire helicopters running around everywhere. There's something wrong mm -hmm. with the thinking. So the problem is upstairs, not <laughs> on these things. So maybe we need to restructure and stop outsourcing thinking mm -hmm. from, uh, to other countries. Indeed. Then we, we might improve a little bit better than, than, than we are doing. Fantastic. All right, it's uh, 7 o'clock on the nose. We want to take a short break. When we circle back, we gravitate now the discussion to what is happening around the region as well. We begin with Uganda, also head to DRC, uh, and uh, also Senegal as well. And also we shall look at the latest development on where there is uh, a word chasm that is developing between Biden and uh, Netanyahu regarding the gas